ever since I was a little kid, uh, you know, I used to spend most of my life outdoors, going, you know, for miles out into the wilderness, you know, turning rocks over and finding salamanders and snakes and reaching into holes in the twee trees and finding screech owls and everything. And all of these creatures had a different view, a different way of thinking. So I, you know, I was more uh, connected, I think, to nature than I was to some of the people in my own neighborhood. And so I think that I knew that what they were telling me about the world just made no sense. Now I know, you know, you go to church and they would say, you know, well, God did it. Well, that, that wasn't going to, well, who made God, you know? And so you, you get back to the circular argument. And uh, so I think that uh, you go to science and supposedly they've got the answers. Well, their answers are more ridiculous. I mean, you have a big bang, a uh, hundred quadrillion zillion tons of matter out of nowhere from nothing, zip, with all the laws specifically a certain way. I mean, it just totally, you know, doesn't make any sense. And then the same thing goes for, you know, you, you can just run through, you know, all the experiments and, and their interpretations. So when I went to uh, school, I was, remember, I, I actually started out in physics in the advanced physics class at the University of Pennsylvania. And the early classes were fine, you know, you know, just learning basic principles. But then they started to cram other things into your head at a really accelerated rate. And I kept saying, no, that's not right, that's not right, because I had already thought this through. And I go, it should be this way and this way. But you, you, you would not pass your test if you said, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. I already figured out relativity. I actually had the equations for how time stops at the speed of light, all these things. I mean, I had worked it out before I even went into the class, and I had no understanding of relativity at the time. I mean, I didn't know anything about Einstein, uh, at least in terms of his equations. So I knew that when I was going through physics, that everything that they started to tell me, I go, oh, I already knew that. So I started to realize that there was a problem, and that if I continued down that course, and there were a couple kids in my class that were 14 that were actually getting their PhD, and they were just cramming more and more and more. And it's a very dangerous thing to assimilate information before you've thought about it. And so I said, uh-uh, no. So I actually uh, decided, I. It was more important to understand what's going on in life and existence than it was to get a degree in physics. So I decided uh, to stay away and, and think this through because all the things that they were telling me were, were seeming to be contradictory. None of it made any sense. And none of it certainly helped me understand what the hell is going on. So, so yeah, so I developed this along the way. Uh, and then I tried to actually, at one point, I approached a publisher to do this in my early years, and they said, Bob, it doesn't work that way, is that when you talk about big ideas, you can only do that at the end of your career, not the beginning. <laughs> if you were Jonas Salk, or you were Christian Barnard, or you were Linus Pauling, you could do that. But no one's going to care what you think. And I said, that doesn't make any sense, but you, know, you, know, you, you should be based on merit. And so you know, we tried, and there was just no way. So they, they recommended, go make a career in science, do that. And then once you've made your reputation, then you can do that. And that's how it had to work. They were right. And then I said, well, this isn't, you know, you talk about, you know, uh, you know uh, these theories, they said, well, this is a, a very complex social issue. I said, no, this is a, a straightforward scientific question. And I didn't understand what they meant by that. Well, it turns out that when you go against the existing orthodoxy, uh, it does get very social issue. Right, exactly. And so then I uh, joined forces with Bob Berman, who is a, a well-known ast uh, astronomer, and he thought exactly this way. But he didn't think I was being truthful because he says he had taken, I guess, LSD. And he says, I know it was right. But he says, you have no reason if you didn't do that. I mean, you know, how, you can't just come up with that logically. I said, you know, if you've experienced it, he said, you had to have experienced it. I said, no. I said, it's, it's the most only rational way to think about things. And so we wrote this book. And as far as the principles, I was telling Ralph this on the way here, why there were seven principles. Well, there were no principles. We wrote the book. And at the end, the editor said, well, you need principles at the end of each chapter. So I had to come up with, well, what was the point of that chapter? And so and I go saying to Ralph, one person asked me, well, why aren't there eight? You know? So, but, but these were the, you know, I just sort of came up with what I thought encapsulated what was being said. But, you know, there could be 10, you know, if we could come up with three more tonight, probably. <laughs>
Okay, I mean, long before I knew anything about special relativity or general relativity, you, you start thinking about time. Okay, what is it? And, and, and I actually came up with the same exact same equation for how time slows down. You say, well, okay, well, biocentrism, he doesn't believe in time, so how can time stop? So what is time? So you look at a clock and the hand goes around, and I always like to say that just because we invented clocks doesn't mean that the time exists. I mean, an ice cube melting could just as well serve, you know, for, uh, you know, five ice cube meltings and I'll meet for tea, you know. And, and so any natural, a rotting apple, it's just events occurring. We just have rhythms. So, you know, the moon goes around the earth or, you know, there's tides or we put some springs in or the decay of atoms. But all they are is relating one event to another. So if you think of, you know, E equals MC squared, matter is made up of, of energy. Okay, so we know, you know, everyone thinks that, you know, this may be solid, but we've now learned that the solid is made up of 99.99% empty space, and it's not inert. It's actually made up of atoms that have electrons and particles spinning around billions or trillions of times a second. So it's really just nothing but motion existing. So what is going on here? So you have particles that make up everything that's matter. So what happens if it's made up of, say, electromagnetic energy or any energy, energy travels at the speed of light, C. So if it's made up of particles all whirling around each other and it's all this material, you have interorbiting dynamic structure. And this is where Einstein split from what he, who he called was the greatest person that he ever knew, Lorenz, and then also the greatest mathematician who actually was the co-discoverer of relativity, Poincaré, who actually, they think that, Einstein may have been at his lecture a year before he came up with relativity and got the relativity principle from him, but that's beside the point. But he refused to make the jumps to, to Einstein's kinematics to, to that because he thought that the laws of nature were in our head. And he was the greatest practical and theoretical mathematician at the time. And so Einstein just jumped to some conclusions. But back to the time example, Lorenz and... Uh, Poincaré, the co-inventor of, of relativity, thought that these phenomena that they were observing were dynamic in nature. So if you have a particle that's made up of energy and you accelerate it to the speed of light, what happens? If all the particles, instead of go in their orbits, have to now go straight, totally straight, just a little use of Perega, uh, you know, the Peregrian theorem, a you know, right angle here, is that there can be no motion to the left or the right. There can be no interorbital motion without it exceeding the speed of light. So that if a particle is moving at C at the speed of light and the particle is accelerated to the speed of light, there can be no interorbital interactions. Time has to stop. And if you do the calculations, time stops exactly according to the equations. Exactly, right to the T. Simple high school arithmetic. So you can predict without Anything fancy, making up invisible matrices out there that are just ticking along independent. I mean, I, I always like to say, you know, you wave your hands through the air and you take everything away, what's left? And the answer's nothing. You know, and the same thing for time. You know, it, it, it's just so silly that they start attributing these magical properties and, and these nothing things do this and this specifically according to equations. And now they've added up to 100 dimensions in some, some equations. They just write down these equations as a new dimension. And I keep thinking, that is really a diversion from what science is about, which is to make sense of what we're experiencing. It's supposed to help us explain. So then you start now running into these experiments, and then they're coming up you know, using the existing paradigm and the existing thinking crazy things. I mean, simple experiments that to you and I probably would just seem so obvious, like the experiment in science just a couple years ago where they sent these photons, these particles, into an apparatus and when the particle hit a fork, it had to decide whether it was going to be a wave or a particle. And then later on, the experimenter could flip a switch on or off and it, it, it turned out that what that experimenter did now, later on, changed what that particle did back in the past. Well, you'd think that, well, duh, something's <laughs> funny here. You, you just changed something that happened in the past. Okay, we live in the same world. What's going on? Oh, they put a name on it, uh, delayed choice. Oh, no problem, no problem, we put a label on it. It's like, that, how does that change anything? And, and, and experiment after experiment. And so I think that, you know, if you look at it, even 
the universe itself. You look at all the parameters and, okay, you say if the Big Bang had been one pot in a millionth more powerful, the galaxies and, uh, and materials would have rushed out too fast for any stars, any planets, anything to, to happen. Or if the gravitational constant was just a hair less, stars wouldn't ignite, you know, no us. Same thing for uh, the, the strong nuclear force. If it was 2% two, two down, all there would be is plain vanilla or hydrogen. There would be no carbon. We wouldn't be. A, hundreds of parameters like this it could have any, any number whatsoever, but every single one is precisely right for us to be here. Wow, oh, gee, oh, that, well, that just happened at the moment when everything just popped into existence out of nowhere with all the laws intact. And it just, okay, this is crazy. So now what they say is luck, just pure luck. Everything's just an accident, you know. And it's like, and I always like to think that when someone says something's an accident, it just means they just don't understand why, you know. And, and it's like, we're here, why are we here? Oh, one in gazillion chance. That's absurd. And if you think about, forget about science, forget about the experiments. We're sitting here right now talking. And if you think of all the hours and days that have existed from all of eternity and pile them on top of each other and then sit yourself on the top, what is the probability by chance, good luck, that you would just accidentally, accidentally be top, sitting on top of all of infinity? It's, it's absurd. <laughs> totally ludicrous. I mean, to look at the world that way I don't know. It just, it's just, I don't know. I, and, and I have fellow scientists that do look at the world that way. And it just doesn't, it, it, but, but that's because they're just told what to think. They've been trained what to think. And I think that, you know, if you stop and you think at very simple things, I mean, this bottle, I mean, I'm sure all of you people, it's not a revelation, but if I were to ask one of my scientific colleagues, you know, you know, look at that bottle. And they'll go, yeah, it's right there. And I'll say, you can't see that through the skull surrounding your brain. And they go, yeah, it's right there. I go, but you can't see that's a construction in your head. There's no way you can see that. They don't get it. What are you, a nut? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, and so if you can't get that far, yeah, so, you know, I, I like to always put it the same as like, you know, a squirrel or a chipmunk and it picks up the egg con and it just runs up the tree. It doesn't think anything about it. It opens its eyes and things are there. It doesn't stop to think about it. And I think that, you know, in a many ways, science is con very concrete. And, but if you stop and you think and you meditate or, or the, the, like these great thinkers in the past thought, it's not very hard to figure out that you can't see that through your skull, that that has to be happening, actually happening in your head. It has to be. You're in my head. You have to be happening in my head. And then we were actually talking, you and your wife, just now on the way in. She was talking about dreams. And I'm saying, well, isn't it odd that you go to bed, you close your eyes, and just information in your brain, you can create a spatial temporal world. You can fly. How is it that you can just turn information into space and time, into hands, into a body that can move? Just an accident. I mean, it's just absurd. There are auger, your mind is actually putting that together, and you can be asleep in bed and moving around and running, and, and you're experiencing space and time. So your mind is putting that together. That's the way your mind thinks. It's the tool of the mind. So, Space and time are tools of consciousness. And, and that is why none of these other things add up about us being on top of infinity, why all the parameters of the universe that way, why all these experiments. I mean, this is, this is why there's such a, a, a division in science. Science is basically divided into relativity and into quantum theory, and, and the, they're incompatible, as you know. And the problem is, is they do these experiments. Of course, you're all aware of them, and the two-slit experiment is the most famous. And, illustrates it pretty well, is that you send a particle through it to a piece of paper that has two holes in it, and you watch it, and it behaves like a little bullet, and it goes through one hole or the other one, just like it's supposed to. So, duh, why would you do that experiment? So, they did that experiment, and sure enough, they watched it and with the, with the uh, detectors at the back, and they did it. But then, what they did is they didn't watch it, and the particle now went through both holes at the same time. Oh, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. How can it go through two holes at the same time? And the only difference is, is that you're watching it. Well, then they said, oh, it's, it's an artifact of the system. You're interfering with it. You know, you're, you're collapsing you're noise in the system. Well, they've done a zillion different versions of this. And the only thing that matters is whether or not the information in your mind is, is whether or not you observe it or not. And so that doesn't make any sense to a scientist because why should it matter what you think as to what a particle is doing out there? 
Well, another bedrock piece of, of, of science right now, or at least of quantum mechanics, is Eisenberg's uncertainty principle. You've heard about that. Uncertainty. So it turns out that if you measure one parameter uh, of a particle, say, for instance, you know, uh, an arrow going through the air, if, if you want to know its exact location, you lose information about its temporal thing. So if you think of it like a, a movie projector of, of a you know, archery uh, arrow going through the air, what happens is, is if you stop that frame, you go, ah, there it is, 20 feet above the grandstand. But you don't know anything about its speed, its, its trajectory, but you start it back up and you go, oh, now there it's aiming for the, the thing, but you no, no longer have specific information about a spatial location. So it turns out that there are all these parameters in science that it's like the, the man and the, the, and the lady in the weather vane in the house where when one goes in the clock, the other one comes out. If you get information about one, you lose information about the other. And this is Einstein's you know, famous thing you know, about you know, God doesn't play dice and all these things. It turns out that what you do measure does affect what's out there. So why should it matter to a particle out there whether you measure its location or its temporal thing? And, and it's because the, your mind strings us together and animates it. So your time is the inner form of intuition. Space is, is the external. Again, this, this was laid out by Immanuel Kant a couple hundred years ago. So if you go through those experiments and you think through in terms of the way I think a lot of the people here think, it all adds up. It has to be that way. You actually know that's how it has to occur. But if you look, work in the old paradigm, it just contradicts each other. It, you, you just can't. So I, I think that that's what we're dealing with. And I, I think that, uh, you know, if you think about, you know, uh, not long ago, they used to think the world was flat and, you know, you just went and you'd fall off the end. And, and if you said to someone it was a round ball, people would go, well, you're nuts. The people at the bottom would fall off. And, you know, and you go, well, but you don't understand. <laughs> and that's what we're faced with here. And so, you know, it's very, very hard, uh, you know, for people to change their views and, you know, and it's just going to take time. And I think it's happening. I, I think it, we can no longer keep sweeping all these experiments under the rug. I remember talking to one physicist and explaining, he says, Bob, he says, even if you had absolute proof this was right, I could, I could never believe. Einstein is right. He's God. It, this is it. This, it doesn't matter what proof you brought me. I, I couldn't believe it. So they just can't, and, the, and they won't. And so, but that's not surprising. You know, when you have a, a, a person who spent their whole life thinking a certain way, it's pretty hard to unravel that. Because they're going to go, but this, but this. But every time they attack you, they're attacking you from within the paradigm that's wrong. I'm, I'm basically saying, you know, that, that we're not an accident of laws of physics, and that's taking them away from basically being God. I mean, they, they would like to believe that they have all the answers for the universe, and in fact, and they've overstepped the legitimate boundaries of science. Science is supposed to deal with understanding phenomenon, not non-phenomena. Space and time, they're assigning physical principles, pro properties to it. That's magic. That's overextending the, 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 the range of science. That's just not scientific. Yet, I'm the one who's, who's being, you know, metaphysical. You know, it's just totally, uh, I, you know, you can't argue with that. I, I think for, for me, what it is, is what makes the most sense? How do you have internal consistency with all the experiments and all the knowledge that we have in front of us? And if, if your system contradicts itself, then something's wrong. Something's wrong. And all we can ever ask is to have a system of thought that is, is internally consistent and, and, and it doesn't, you know, one part doesn't contradict the other. Otherwise, you know, you, you need to go back to the drawing board. And science is there, I mean, big time. <laughs> We're at a very primitive point right now, and I, and I always, you know, uh, like to, to think, you know, I always say that we were evolved in the forest roof to collect fruit and berries, not to understand the universe. So we're very, very primitive. And so when I try to say, explain biocentrism, you know, it, 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 it's, it's very abstract for a lot of people. But for me, it's, it's, it's really hard because what I think, and I'm, I'm sure what a lot of people here feel and, and, and know to be the case, there aren't words for it. The words are wrong. I mean, I have to use the English language, or if I use another language, there are words, and almost the, the use of any of those words which are designed to break up nature into, into fragments have problems with them. So I have to communicate using a very, it's like using, you know, a, a, a 
a ratchet, you know, to, to hammer a nail, and it's the wrong tool. So when I describe biosensorism, I'm trying to, to get a bigger picture out there, but, but the words really don't exist for most of these concepts. And even biocentrism is just only that far. I mean, I mean, I would love to write part two and three, but no one would understand me. It wouldn't have a clue. It just it wouldn't relate. What they always say is for pseudoscience is, is when you're too far away from the existing school of knowledge. So if you go too far, there's nothing for people to relate to. And this is very abstract for a lot of people to understand. I mean, people think of space and time in very concrete yeah, things. I'm going to be late for work. My boss is going to kill me. You know, you, you think of very concrete terms. You're not thinking of it as, you know, a, a tool of intuition. You know, it just doesn't. So I, I think that we do have intrinsic limits. And I, but I do think that, like driving a car, that after you drive the car, you don't have to worry about that. So then, you, you know, you can talk on your cell phone or text, you know, because you don't got to worry about the pedals. So my guess is, is that in 100 years, those students will probably be where we're at, <laughs> and then they can go the next level where people can then can understand the next layer. Because cause clearly, what, what I'm telling you about, I, I mean, I can only go that far without sounding like a nut. <laughs> Although, a lot of what the, the great spiritual leaders came up with is exactly what I would conclude. I mean, because they're correct. It's just you know, when you try to explain it, you know, what, what does it mean for civilization? The truth of the matter, if space and time aren't real entities, the walls of space and time don't exist. So, so if you hurt another person, you're hurting yourself. You're just too stupid to know it. I mean, I don't mean just theoretically or poetically, for real. I mean, you are really, if, if I punch you, I'm going to experience that, for real. But you say, well, 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 I'm the one with the suit and you're the one with the blood. You know, but it doesn't work like that. So, so it would lead to an absolute humane society, you know. But, you know, whether we could ever get to that point, there's too many people who would want to take advantage of whatever exists. That, and I don't know if we can get there, but, you know, I think certainly anyone in the know would, would, would realize that. And, and it's at the point where, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people who really are pissed. I mean, real pissed. So, and, uh, you know, as you know, a lot of people are very critical. And then you either, Immanuel Kant summed it up really well. Uh, he, he actually, I think it was Hubert Spencer, the great philosopher at his time uh, in the 17th century, uh, was, uh, he was 18th, he, 18th century, he actually was reading uh, Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason and threw it on the ground and said, he's a stupid man. You know, and that's the reaction. And Immanuel Kant had said, I have to presuppose that people, so anybody who doesn't have the roots of this within them is going to react that way. And that you have to have those roots within you or you won't. And indeed, that's exactly what you find. There are people go, it resonates and they go, right on, Bob. And there are other people that want to put me in a straitjacket. And, you know, so, you know, I guess that's a good place to be, you know. <laughs> and, 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 you know but, but, but if I went any further, you know, then I, I would have lost all credibility. So, you know, if it, if it you know, people understand it and it's, it is established, then I could take the next step and write the book I would want to write. <laughs> but I, I can't do that right now without losing credibility. But if people start to understand that there is a problem with the, the, uh, our world view, and I think it's happening, it's happening pretty quickly, that, you know, probably it may not even be 100 years before people realize, because we're in transition in, in our world views. Well, it, it, it's not going to free you from, you know, pain and suffering. That's what life is about. I mean, you know, you, you, without putting your sweat in, nothing's going to really mean anything. What it will do is, is it will give you, a, to some extent, I wrote the book and a lot of the blogs that I've, I've written, is, is that a lot of people, for instance, are just terrified that this is going to die and cease to exist. And they have loved ones that have, that, you know, the loss of, of, of a spouse or a child or someone that's very dear to you. I mean, it's, it's almost beyond what these people can bear because, you know, and it's over. The, you know, you die, it's just run at the ground and it's over. And, and people are afraid of death. And I'm thinking, all of you people are afraid of these things and you're worrying about the wrong thing. You know, it's like, it's like you silly people out there. It's like, you know, don't worry about that, believe me. You know, it's like, my father, my father you know, is only have probably a few weeks left. He says, but how can you be sure? How can you be sure? You know, and it, it's, but it's like, 
I mean, it, it, it just seems, I mean, once you start to think this way, it just becomes absurd to, to think any other way. I, I come from a sort of a rough background, so I, I need a lot of color to, you know, to, to, to be entertained. So, so I <laughs> cause trouble no matter what, even though I could be at complete peace with myself if I wanted, but I'd be bored. <laughs> but but it, it's good to know that no matter what happens, it doesn't, it, it's okay, it's fine. You're experiencing life, that's what it's about. So. Yeah, I mean, that's why I take my risk. You live your life. That's what it's about. That's what, that's what you're doing. And, uh, you know, th th yeah, I don't know. It, just, it, 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 it does give you a sense of peace in that nothing can really go wrong. Yeah, I mean, you, you may die or, you know, something bad may happen. But, but I, 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 just, I, mean, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble with this, but I, I sort of uh, ascribe to Spinoza's view of happiness, pain, and happiness. Happiness is the transition up pain is a transition down. So you really can't disconnect those. What you can do, though, is to change the way you view life, how you treat other human beings, and, and the way you view what's going on. What physics is just trying to do is, you know, take the, the clock apart and figure out how big the wheel is and how it spins and is it a smaller one or is it, is it a, a screw or is it a Phillips or is it a regular screwdriver that they, they put it together with. And, and they may learn that and that may give our lives some comfort and maybe they can feed more people or do whatever. So I, I think, you know, trying to understand how the pieces go together is interesting, but I, I would put that in the category with Einstein once said that he's not interested in this or that detail. He's interested in you know, how God made the world. And I, they're not going to figure that out. So, you know, I think that they're basically just trying to figure out, uh, you know, just like what most scientists do. We're technicians, you know, and, you know, and they're no different than surgeons. So I don't think that that in any way, shape, or form could even remotely start to tell us anything about life and existence, that, 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 that they can't do that. So they're basically just trying to figure out what's going on within the world that's here. You know, you know, you know how does a virus replicate? You know, how, you, know, you know, how do the molecules go together? That sort of thing. So I think it's a, obviously all of the things that we've seen in, in, in terms of you know, cars and automobiles and, and our quality of life have happened through understanding, you know, how to manipulate the matter around us. But it, it, it doesn't at all impact the bigger questions or, or the things that are really important in life. So I always like to say that, that reality is a process. It's an active process. It's not a thing. It's not an object. So everything you can know, feel, and experience is, is a form of consciousness. It's, you're experiencing spatial, temporal relationship. It's an act. That's why you, when you ultimately dissect into the atom here, all you got is these particles whirling around. Is it, it's motion. It's mo and what is motion? Is the movement in space in time. So that is what motion is. As a matter of fact, when you look at the electric, me electromechanical wave, you have the magnetic wave jumping over the, the uh, generates the, the electric versus then that generates the magnetic at right angles and it leapfrogs at, at the speed of light. So what it is is you're defining, it's actually an equation and it's actually a, 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 a structure that defines at the very bottom of the universe or the bottom of the physical world that network that, that if you were to rationally dissect it would define space and time in in movement, which is how it all assembles the energy. So, so again, when you think of a rock or you think of your, your body, you're already dealing with a spatial temporal construct. So anything electromagnetic energy, any particle, uh, a cell, in, in you call your brain, your brain, that's already a spatial temporal construct. So it, it so when people get confused when they call you know you, you call it brain or you call it mind, uh, if there's no space and time before you know, there are tools of the mind that can't be rocks or objects without them. So again, reality is a process. It's it's not a thing. So the rock, uh, any physical uh, object, has no existence independent of life. All consciousness. Yeah, so we can only know our universe, and that's us, and every, you know, 13.7 billion years back or whatever. So that is our universe, but space and time are, 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 are tools of us genomic-based creatures. So you, you, know, you, you think of the logic of you and I being here on, on top of time. Uh, even 
Stephen Hawkins now, you know, is, has a new top-down cosmology where he's saying everything is the probability waves and it, it actually, the, the past is determined by the present. So if you think about it, if a particle has all these possible outcomes and it's not until you observe it that it collapses to one probability, and until there's a present, how can there be a past? So, so what you have here are ways we think, which is again why we're on top of infinity and, and why it's not, you know, you say a gazillion chance of all the things that had to be right for us to actually be here. That, that, that's absurd. The, the, the probability of us being here is zero because that's not the way it works if you're thinking in that terms. It, it's because I'm sitting here and if you follow that spatial temporal logic, this, is, this floor is, is in California. I've got to remember where I'm at. And that's going on the Earth, which is spinning around, which is going around the Sun, which is going around the Milky Way. And if you go ultimately to the, to the exhaustive spatial temporal logic, you will come to the end of the known universe, physically, you know, the uh, spatial universe. And if you go all the way back in logic to time, you go back to your singularity. But they're theoretical constructs because, again, all we are is extrapolating that spatial temporal logic. But that doesn't necessarily mean those are the only information systems possible. But we can't understand those other systems because we think in terms of space and time. So all of our knowledge is going to be relational based on spatial temporal thinking. You can only experience the world piece by piece. That's the only way it could possibly work. I mean, otherwise nothing would exist. If you weren't you and experiencing you the way you are, Nothing would exist. So, in other words, what's, what's going on is that you only can experience the world piece by piece because that's, by definition, how the process works. It's what, what you're trying to, where you're running into the problem with you and me, what it comes down to is, is how you connect space and time. Space and time, I, I always like to say that they're like the shells that the turtle carries around, that, that we carry them around. That is why space and time are relative to the observer. That is why all these experiments are all showing that the, all the behavior, every single property of, of an elementary particle out there is, is observer determined. And so what is going on is, is that your linearness, your, everything you can possibly think about the universe and about everything is going to be relative to you. And then what happens is, is that then for me, it's another sphere. We're all separate spheres. But where you can't make that connect is that space and time aren't just out there ticking. They're not objects. And so this linear sense of time. Einstein even said, it, you, know, the, the, you know, the distinction between past, present, and, and future is just a stubbornly persistent illusion. We want to just, because you know, we know we die and you know, we'll have kids and uh, we know, you know we had grandparents and we, there were dinosaurs and so we, we just automatically just assume you know, time is you know, like an arrow. It's linear. But, it, but it's not. I mean, yes, all those are relative, and all those events did occur in those relations that, that you're aware of from your scientific books. But what the, your scientific books have wrong is, is that when you die, there's not a matrix out there that's just ticking, and it all goes on, and you're just some ashes down there, because that, that's just not the way the world works. It's not the way matter works. It's not the way, you know, objects are, are put together. So, so you're only capable and we're only capable of, of, of relational thinking. So your space and time is always going to be relative to you and it's, there will be a break. So when you die in, in this, the continuity, say for instance, in, in those connections, you can no longer just think of, of everything only being in that time course. You have to think of it more as you can take any perspective as your new perspective. So every, like Einstein said, you know, every observer is, uh, you know, is, is, is relative to itself. So w without your unique perspective, you can take any other viewpoint as your own. You're just trying to, what you're, you're, you're doing is, is you're connecting up your space and time as though there's a matrix out there that's still ticking away. And it's not that way. That is why that particle, when they don't look at it, is the probability way even can do everything. It's a statistical probability. It's not real until it's observed. It's all relative. So if she dies, you're still going to be here, right? I'm still going to be here. That, that's, that's, that's the case. It's just how you're connecting them up. It, yes, if, if, if you know, I were to kill somebody, they would die. But that's happening within 
our common overlapping experience. And so cause and effect happens. I always like to say, people say, well, well if, if your mind creates all that, then why isn't the, wor the be one person criticized, one physicist criticized me, says the best proof that Lanza is wrong is, is that the world isn't the way we want it. And I always say, well, well now if you jump off the roof, you're going to get hurt pretty bad. I said the cause, you know, uh, cause and effect is going to kick in. That's, that's the way it works. So we can't change cause and effect. Now, I don't know what people believe in particular about that, but, but the point is, 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 th is that, that, the, that the way we put these pieces together are, are, are correct relative to the way we experience them. But it doesn't mean that there's a matrix out there that's just going to tick. And that, like, uh, you know, that if we, we were to die, the world is just going to still go around without us human beings. It, 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 that's, again, reality is a process. I don't, I don't know if I'm getting there. I always think of the universe this way. Think of it this way. is that a, a record, a vinyl record, and you're listening to a song, okay? And before that song is, is the, the past and the, before ahead of it is, is the future. But you only listen to one of those songs at a time. But, but if you're not listening, it doesn't mean the record doesn't exist. It always exists. It's just that you can only listen to one song at a time. You die, you know, it's, it's just, it's just a, a reboot. I mean, however you want to say, you can go through all different ways, you know, reincarnation, whatever you want to do. They're all relative. It's just as long as you get your terms right. But the, the bottom, all the moral of the story is, is that this silliness about, you know, like I said, that, you know, you die and you just rot into the ground and, you know, and the world just ticks along independent of, of, of you know, the space and time which are necessary for its very existence. It just it doesn't, it doesn't add up. And all the experiments, one after the other after the other, I could run through a hundred different experiments that every one of them shows you that all the properties of matter, of particles, Eisenberg's uncertainty principle, all of these are observer determined. They're all based on the observer. And now, I grant you that the physicists will attack me and they will say, Oh, you're just stupid because everyone knows that those quantum phenomena only occur in the micro world of the atom and that there's another world, us, the world of us human beings, that's a whole other set of laws for. And it's, and so I always, I come back and go, well, they've done new experiments. They have crystals back in 2005 that had entanglement ridges that big. And so I always say, well, then where are the laws of physics changed between there and there? <laughs> you know, you know, and, you know, and they've now done these huge, they did, there's a paper that was published in Nature last year uh, with ions that uh, were entangled, uh, that, that had all the quantum phenomena. They, they've got buckyballs that were carbon-60 molecules. And actually, I think there was something just a few weeks ago that was like 10 times bigger that had all the quantum properties that was bigger than a carbon-60 molecule. So we're already into the macroscopic world, and those properties, indeed, uh, are still there. It's just that... They, still not going to change their thinking. I mean, I'm sure that we would do the scaled up superposition and show what happens that there, and it's not going to change their thinking. It's just, it's just too confusing for them because they would have to throw away everything they've ever learned or everything they, they, they think about reality and nature. And it, that's a hard thing to do without causing turmoil to the way you think. <laughs> the only problem is, is they don't want to deal with the word consciousness or mind. You cannot accidentally be on top of infinity. You can't. You can't. <laughs> You're here. That's not an accident, and you, it just can't be. Okay, so you can't die. <laughs> you 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 might have to. You, know, <laughs> you can die, but you know, <laughs> you got to define your you. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, no, no. no it, 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 you know, we're trapped with all these words, and you know, and it, and that's one of the problems. And all of our language, everything we've ever been bombarded with on TV, all the movies, everything, is is you know the. You know, the world is just out there. It's just, it's just, just this thing. It's an object. And it's just, you know, now we've got these experiments showing, well, wait a minute, whoa, that doesn't seem to be adding up anymore. But, you know, they can't, you know, it's just very hard to change your worldview. It's very hard. Where you get into the problems is, is okay, Einstein's idea works for big objects. But then how can it be that, if this is the way the universe is, that if it works for there, then it doesn't work here. How can the laws of the universe break down? And so what you can say is, oh, okay, that hypothesis works here, but it breaks down there, so 
that's a problem. But biocentrism doesn't break down. <laughs> so, so a good theory in theory is not going to break down or contradict the data or the information. Space and time aren't like these objects or the floor. We all know that. And they, they, you look out over the horizon and they go forever. What is space? You know there's something wrong there that they're, 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 they're not things out there. And so you intuitively know that, right? Think about the dreams again. You, you're dreaming. Your eyes are closed, and all you have is information. So how can information be turned into space and time when you're with your eyes closed in bed? You're able to fly. You're able to move your hands. That's just information your mind is creating space and time. It's creating it. It's creating it when you're dreaming. How can you be in bed right and actually move and walk that's just information that your mind has created space and time it's created it and, and Thoreau really actually you think about Thoreau and Emerson they were two American transcendentalists and they the, along with Lauren Isley and myself all sort of think the same way that the, the, you know it's a transcendental reality that's why I identify more with artists and creative types because at least they're open-minded and able to try to, you know, see things, you know, a little less rigidly than, you know, some of my colleagues. And so, so yeah, I, I think that, you know, you, you, you see elements of this, you know, in, in, in a lot of places. Not so much in science, but elsewhere, yes. <laughs> we mentioned Emerson. Oh, I mean, he's got it right on the nail, his poetry. Oh, I mean, he's got this right to the, go back and read him. And, ah, I mean... He couldn't, he figured out how to express it in poetry. And he really had a real good grasp of this. So you go back and you read that and you go, wow, that guy's brilliant. And he had it exactly right. You know, he talks about, you know, you know the unity, you know, getting the diversity from unity and, and being in a holy spot where suddenly, you know, you, you, you're conscious. The phraseology is just, oh, it's unbelievable. If you go through and read some of his essays, uh, they're so poetic, but they're right on, right on, and very accurate. What space and time are, are uh, that, that's the language of consciousness. That's how everything you can think or know or experience happens. And without those, that, there is no such thing as a concept or an idea or an experience or, or sensations or anything. So those are the tools. That is the information system that we use for everything. And, you know, and whether that's, you know, you're colorblind or you're going to see colors or whether you're the bird or whatever, you know, but that, that's all, you know, and then we all go back further than that. Like I said, I always like to say, you know, you go back and, you know, we're made up of carbon and if you follow the logic back that that carbon was made in the heart of supernova exploding stars and you can follow that logic all the way back. That's all spatial temporal logic from a genome based creature. Uh, and like I said, I mean, being speculative, I'm sure there may be other information systems out there, but there's no way, you know, with us working with space and time as our tools that, that we can really uh, fathom what that's about. If you are connected by the energy, which is what you are, that's everything that's associated with you, that you, you know that all these things have to happen a certain way. And so then you, you talk about, okay, well, the... Particles are put together a certain way, so the, the, the strong and weak nuclear force and electromagnetic force and these things. Those are just basically, I mean, I'm sure you could break those up into other categories, you know, subdivide them and all. But they're basically just the way the world is put together, I mean, in terms of the, the system. So, you know, if you think about it, uh, you know, if I have this bottle, again, if I were to look a little smaller down into that spatial temporal logic, it's not that it would be natural for an, uh, you know, a chickmunk or a lower animal to ever have to use the spatial temporal reasoning for that purpose, but we as a scientist can get microscopes and electron microscopes and we can find out that this is made up of molecules that are assembled this way or that way and then actually go smaller and smaller till we finally come to the very, very bottom where you, you basically get down to just energy, electromagnetic energy moving in a multiplicity of, of configurations. So all we're really doing is, is Lauren Isley actually said it really well, is, is that all science has really done is extended our sense perceptions, whether it's through a telescope or, or, or a matter microscope. And all those forces and all those things we're doing is just investigating how that logic plays out. So and if you drop the apple or you jump off the roof, you'll get more information about how it works. 
<laughs> but but again, think of think of it like a calcul. Yeah, I guess I agree. No, but more more realistically, think about it like a, a calculator. You know, you take your new calculator back from the store, take it out of a plastic container, and you multiply four times four, and it comes out sixteen, even though that number has never been multiplied. Or you know. Uh, 16 minus, you know, 4, and you get 12, and you can do all these things, and even though no one may ever multiply them or ever do it, it's a system that will always, whenever you multiply or divide, will do this calculation. And it's the same with your mind. I mean, yes, you know, people get into injuries and nail, uh, nails go through their head and all sorts of things, and you can mess up with it, you can take drugs and to do it, but by and large, there's, there's a, 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 a way that information is being assembled. As a matter of fact, it's very amazing. I mean, you know, not that biocentrism is going to shed any particular light on it, but, you know, you probably, could, you probably know more about it than I do. I, I remember there was a patient that was blind, totally blind, but if you put a pole up in front of them, that he would actually duck because the information for vision is all multiple pieces that are assembled into that. And so I, I think that, you know, you're talking about a lot of information that is, uh, goes into it. For instance, if I move my head real fast, uh, you know, the room doesn't seem to move. In other words, it, it, your, your mind always keeps it steady. Even though I may be blinking or my eyes moving back and forth, you don't just keep going back and forth. Your mind is keeping it stable. So there's a lot of logic, uh, spatial temporal logic, if you want to have it and all that goes into that, very much like a calculator or your DVD or your CD player. It's just probably a little bit more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is consciousness. I mean, all, every, space and time are tools, uh, it's the language of consciousness. So everything right here that you're experiencing, everything that's happening is, is, is happening. It's a construct. Everyone that's in your consciousness is here. Yeah, yeah. But that's where it gets really tricky and that's where the multiple worlds and stuff comes in is, is that, you know, to the best of our ability, it appears as though that those particles going through the two whole experiments can have, you know, this is the statistical probability of the wave function, is, is that they have a, a, a range of possible uh, potentials of what they could be or where they could be, and only when you observe it do they collapse to one of those. And what the many worlds view says is, is that, that each of those possibilities corresponds to its own history or universe. So that if I flip that switch in the experiment where it decided what the particle did in the past, uh, you know, one gives you a different history, a different universe, and the other. I'm still the same person flipping the switch, but both is different paths and probably the same by the, in the future. And it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that because you say, well, we're all in this room. Well, we're all in this room according to the certainty that you've collapsed, but there's an uncertainty as to what will happen outside this. So I had one piece where I, I, I went back to like JFK, who killed JFK, and said that it may not be determined yet who killed JFK. And they go, what? <laughs> you know, that's, that's sort of crazy. And so you, you go back to the Schrodinger's cat experiment, uh, where, you, you know, the Schrodinger's cat experiment where they put the cat in the box and, this, you know, you know the, the the poison goes in, and, and, and there's a 50-50 chance that that, that, that that particle will be released. And if, it, if the particle is detected, it will release a poison gas and kill the cat. And so the question is, 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 is there were all these great famous debates with Niels Bohr and all the, the great physicists, and they always want, in the end, it was the Copenhagen interpretation, is that that cat is neither alive or dead until it's actually observed. And even now, Stephen Hawkins is, is basically, with his philosophy now, not philosophy, his science, uh, the top-down cosmology is, is that, you, that the, the, the past and the future exist only as potential. And so what is going on, going back to the JFK analogy, is say there were two sharpshooters that aimed at him, okay, and they had a 50-50 chance of killing him. Okay? Until you go back and investigate, you don't know which one killed. So one person could have killed in one circumstance and one death. And actually both probably would exist if it was a 50-50 chance. And so as you collapse more and more information, uh, the, 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 the fluidity of the system gets narrower, very much like the two-hole experiment. 
So it's, it's very hard to put your mind around, but you are, as you move through life, you're collapsing a probability and a whole range of things around you. But there's also fluidity, like if I was on the ground, as to beneath me, what's underneath me. So, you know, uh, is there, was it be, would there be sand or a rock or was there a glacial movement? And there's a certain probability that, that it could even be a diamond. And, but those probabilities are more remote. So a lot of things are allowed with a degree of uncertainty, and then there may be less restriction. So, you know, the fact that I'm here right now, collapse, sort of limits some of the possibilities about whether I'm here or not. But, <laughs> but, but, but not, not completely. So it's, it's, this, is, this, is again, I, this is, again, Einstein's that God doesn't play dice, that he that didn't believe that everything was statistical. But when you're talking about the mind, think about this. Is, think about it this way here. This is probably a, another way to think about it. Is if your if your mind is seeing you here, right, like this. There's a scaffold that's being laid down over nothingness. Okay, so there's nothing out there. So you have your energy. And if I were to take instruments and then I were to probe deeper and deeper into into these particles, I would find out more and more about where those particles are being collapsed at at that time. But eventually, if you get small enough, like to, to you know, like a, a, a electromagnetic wave, there's nothing less than that. And so, what's between that, the electromagnetic, the energy? What's between it? Nothing. It's nothing. That's why there's uncertainty because there is nothing there. It, it's it's the relation, the spatial temporal relation. So you have uncertainty, and that uncertainty can build. And so, it, it, you say that that an electron going through the particle. Okay, it's. You shoot the machine, the electron gun, and it's aimed at the, 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 at the, the little slit. And probably a pretty high probability it's going to go that way and not that way. So you can re re reduce that probability. But you can also reduce it, whether it's going to go through that hole or that hole. And again, but there's an uncertainty as to uh, what it could do physically. And so until you actually observe it and lay the scaffolding of what it is, it could have all those possibilities, which is why when you observe it, it will do exactly one thing and do, go through exactly one hole. But if you don't, it's still an uncertainty. And it's only, and then it goes, goes through both holes at the same time. And then when you observe it, you will find that, oh, it went through both holes. And so you go, okay, I watched it and it went through one. I didn't watch it and it went through both. That's because there's a, a physical, statistical chance likelihood of a particle being somewhere if the gun is aimed that way, for instance. And that's true for any material event. There's a certain range of uncertainty. So what they can do with particles, or any particles that they measure, is they can actually measure, like I said, you know, with the Eisenberg's uncertainty principle, you can measure the location, you'll lose information about the temporal information or, or momentum, and vice versa. And so it, it turns out that w when you collapse that uh, uncertainty to, to one, that you know that is an event that uh, you know has cause and effect consequences that then then become part of your reality. But until you do that, it's uncertainty. In other words, it's not just out there. So it, it's it's whatever you observe, that is is what the reality is. And then there's a certain spatial temporal logic that is going to go with what will follow. But there's a lot of fluidity, you know, whether you, you trip down the stairs when you go down or you don't, uh, you know, and, you know, that, that hasn't happened yet. So, and, and similarly for the past. So there, there is definitely a fluidity right down to the individual subatomic particles all the way up to you. And as you become a bigger object, the, the uncertainty that you are going to observe around here, like this, this isn't going to go through the wall like it might in, the, in a subatomic particle where you know, things can, can actually, you know, uh, actually go through at a certain probability through actual objects. So that becomes hotter in the macroscopic world, but that doesn't mean that the same rules don't apply. So, you know, again, space and time will always be relative to the observer. That's what relativity, all those experiments show. Everything is always going to be relative to the observer. The only distinction biocentrism will have to the relativity theory is, is that they might say that, you know, an inanimate object might be able to pick up that relative. But I always, and that's one of the criticisms people always say of biocentrism, and I always say, you know, but that when I talked about that, the, the experiment where they send the particle through with the fork, there was a detector that measured that, just like a camera could, could take a picture. 
and it was only after when they, they flipped the second switch that, that what that detector measured changed. So it's not just that that event changed, but the recording logic, that whole system changes. And that would be true for us. So that, you know, and that, that's what's hot. It's the whole history of the universe, the whole universe, is relative to what you're doing. And that's where the multiple world thing comes in, which is, is that all those possibilities you know, are associated with a history. Just like you flip the switch on and it changed it to becoming a, this or that, uh, you know, there, there are a greater number of, of events like that that you can, co can modify. My philosophy is a little bit odd in that I, I don't, you know, when you talk about intentions and, and uh, fates and determinism and chaos and order and, uh, and then you know, talk about nothingness and somethingness. I always think of all those words as relational, you know, and uh, you can't have light without dark. You know, you, you, the idea of having something means nothing if there's not such thing as nothing. You can't have one without the other concept. The concept have no meaning if there's not one. So everything, all that information is just relational. So when you talk about, in, in, you know, intentions of, of, of their, you know, you're, you're running into that same bit of a problem because... Uh, what you're experiencing and what you do, because this is, comes back to those experiments that were all carried out that, that when you make a decision to, to lift your finger, that actually that decision was actually made, you can actually measure it before you even made the decision to lift your finger. So you get even complicated when you talk about intentions along very real experiments like that. And, and those can be addressed, but it, it, again, the, it's the terminology and how you're using it. But I, but I think... Uh, you know, you know, if you're talking about intention, it's, it's really your behavior. What, what you do is if you go somewhere, you're collapsing probability ways. If, you, if I would decide to turn here, I've made my intention what to do. And, and then there's a fluidity there that is different, even though I won't, will never know it. And, you know, you could actually experience a different one because that's the way they can actually go together. So, again, there are multiple possibilities to, to many events. And like I said, a lot of physicists believe anything that's physically possible has to happen. How can you have a state of nothingness? Because that's creating something. If you're having a state of nothing, you've created something. You've become God. There's no such thing as a state of nothingness. There, it, 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 that, that, those are silly ideas. Something and nothing, don't, that, that, that's the whole thing is, is, is this solid or, or it's, it's mainly empty or is it stationary or is it, is it, is it, is it all these particles moving a, a trillion times around a second. It's, it's at what level you're looking at this and so what might be right at a superficial level is wrong when you look at it from a more detailed level. So when you're talking about something and nothing, you, you're creating your own conflict because you got, you know, you've got something. Well, to have nothing is mean you're creating something. <laughs> There's not a state of nothingness. That's how you'd. Then, then you've got a dilemma of what came first, God. Who, where did God come from? They're all temporal things. There, you're, you're running. You, you're creating a conflict with your own thinking. I'll try to use totally different words because I'm going to get into trouble if I use any regular words. It's, it's, it's the universe is a. Uh, okay, I'll try to use different words. An information system. It's like, it's, it's like that record I was talking about. It, it is just their relationships. That's, that's all they are. And, and that's it. They're, there are information relationships. They have nothing to do with space or time or, or something or nothing or nothing. It's just information relationships. And that is what exists. That's the record. Okay? Your, your space and time are a our, our way we're experiencing and we're doing it. And you'll be just as soon be gone as not be here. So that is, that is why space and time work their way that way is because they're both something and nothing according to the reasoning if you follow it. So that, so that they really don't contradict it. It's only when we try to come up with some sort of terms that don't exist. Is, I don't know if I'm making any sense. You could ask what's the value of a flower or a tree or a rock. I mean, you know, it, it, it is. It just is. It is what it is. So you make your own value out of this. And, you know, for me, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, your experience in life, you know, you know, if, if someone beats up your little child, what the value is in that. I mean, you, you experience in life and you have a sense of right and wrong and, and certain things and you make your judgments and, and that is what's important. You're experiencing life. There's no intrinsic 
good or bad, other than I can say is that if you, you punch someone in the end, there's absolute justice. It's just you don't know it. So, but so, so just maybe being smart about it. <laughs> in the end, if you're alive, you're experiencing life, and go for the ride. <laughs> you know, it, it is. That's, that's it. It's just, you know, it is. I mean, you know, go out and you know, smell the star jasmine, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, but, you know, you, you can also get too greedy about it, too. I, again, the Spinoza transition, happiness is transition up and down, or Aristotle's gold median. If you go to the middle, you're not going to have as much extremes and, and pains, and you can be content. But you've got to live according to your own constitution. So, you know, for some people, they want serenity, they want peace, and they want contentment. And you'd say, well, who wouldn't? No, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I want turmoil and trouble. And of course, then when I have it, I don't want it. But, you know, and so they always say the keenest pleasures are for those who have the keenest pains. And, you know, but, you know, I, some of the people who I've known who I've respected the most in my life are self-actualized people who are always, were always content, and I always admired how they were, but now that I had always had the option now to be that way, I, I you know, don't really want to do that. <laughs> and and, and it, what it is, is, is you can go back to Maslow's stages of self-actualization. You know, we all have needs and wants, and so our first wants and needs are, you know, we need to be able to breathe, we need to have food, and then after we have that, then we're going to want friends, and then we're going to want to, then after that, you're going to want prestige, and you want people to, to respect what you think and you do. And after you get all of this, Maslow stage measured these people who, like Ben Franklin, these other people, what were they like? Once all your wants and needs were satisfied, what these people all had traits in common. They were philosophical, they were reflective, had a sense of humor. They, you know, so they had certain traits. So think about it. We have all these wants and needs, and once you don't have to worry about getting potatoes on the table and, and that sort of thing, you can turn to art and philosophy and be reflective because you're not worrying about you know, losing your leg or your kid dying. You know, so those immediate... Uh, primary needs are being satisfied. So, so then things sort of shift. And who was it? One of the great philosophers said that uh, perfection is, is death. Is it, you have no more reason to get up. Once you've had all your needs satisfied completely, you, have no, you have no more wants or needs. If you want to really enjoy this water, you've got to be thirsty first. Or if you want to have a good meal, you've got to be hungry. <laughs> you know, so you've got to have the wants and the needs, but as soon as you satisfy them, you know, get your pleasure from the satisfying, they're gone. I, I, think, I think humans on the evolutionary scale are, uh, you know, of what's possible and other possible forms of thinking, consciousness, or whatever, are like, we're a little bit. We're just, just above the chickmunk. You know? <laughs> so we get a hint of it. But, 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 but we're, we're collapsed this reality. We're at the point, we're human beings, and the other... 20 humanoid species are all extinct, so we're just the lucky one that's still here right now. But maybe in one of the other ones, they're the lucky ones. But, you know, there's so many different things that are, that are possible. I would say that surely in some of uh, people who have understood the, the algorithms and have modified them, that, I mean, we're, we're going to look very ridiculous. We'd look really ridiculous. I mean, and they would understand this. And Actually, the truth of the matter is, is you can't, as a human being, understand it. It's not consistent with living. It's not consistent with that. Because then everything would have no meaning. And I, I always, I mean, I, I don't know who I'm going to contradict or offend here, but I always think that, you know, that, uh, someone defined passion as an inadequate idea. Once you cerebrally understand it, it goes away. <laughs> you know, it does, it does. So you, you just live your I, I like to be like a kid, like a child and just experience life. If you think about it, it's going to go away.